Hello there, my name is Gary Sims from Android Authority. Now, when you've been hearing about smartphones, particularly when you've been hearing about smartphone processors, maybe you've come across this term, custom core. Now, the question is, what is a custom core? Why do people make such a fuss about them? And who is it that actually designs them? Well, let's find out. So inside your smartphone, there's a thing called a system on a chip. It's a silicon chip with various components on it, including a CPU, a GPU, a memory controller, a DSP, and maybe a few other interesting bits and pieces. Now, the design for the CPU can come from one of several places, including from Intel or from ARM. Now, all iPhones and the vast majority of Android phones use CPU designs from ARM. So there are some differences between ARM and Intel when it comes to their business models and when it comes to the philosophy of designing their chips. For example, all ARM chips are RISC chips. Now RISC stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computing, whereas Intel chips are Complex Instruction Set Computers or CISC computers. Now what does this mean? That means that in a Reduced Instruction Set Computer, the, the number of available instructions to the programmer are reduced, they are simpler. But the downside is that you might have to do two or three instructions to achieve the same thing as you could with one single instruction on a CISC chip. But the idea is because they are simpler, it means the chip is easier to design and it can run faster because it's doing less complicated work and it can run through those instructions actually a lot quicker. Now I said there was a business difference between the way these two companies work. Intel makes its own chips, it designs its own chips, it manufactures its own chips, and it sells them directly to other companies like Asus for the Zenfone 2, for example. ARM is different. ARM doesn't have a fabrication plant, it doesn't make chips, it doesn't have a physical place. What it does, it just designs chips and then it licenses those designs to other companies like Qualcomm or like Samsung. As a result of this licensing arrangement, ARM has lots and lots of partners who partner with it to build actual physical silicon chips. And the big partners in terms of smartphones are Qualcomm and Samsung and Huawei and MediaTek and Nvidia and so on. Now, each one of these companies is a licensee. Now, there are two types of licensees. They can either be a core licensee or they can be an architectural licensee. Now, a core licensee is someone who takes the, the exact core design for, let's say, the Cortex-A57 or the Cortex-A72, and they bring it as it is into their chip design, adding on the other stuff that they want to add on around that chip. Now, the other type of licensee is an architectural licensee. Now, these are people that say, we want to license your architecture, the instruction set and the, the philosophies behind reduced instruction set computing, but they want to design their own actual chip and then put that on their system on a chip. Now, many times these companies that are architectural licenses are also core licenses. So they have a choice when they come to design an SOC, whether they want to use a core from ARM or whether they want to design their own one. And this is where we get the term custom core. It's the idea of an ARM li architectural licensee who has designed their own core rather than using a core from ARM. Now, ARM has several architectural licensees, and they include Qualcomm and Samsung and Nvidia and Huawei and, of course, Apple. And what I have to do quickly is look at how these different companies are using their custom cores, how they're using their architectural licenses from ARM. So first of all, let's look at Qualcomm. Now, Qualcomm is really a classic example of an ARM licensee. It licensed core design. So for example, the Snapdragon 810 uses the Cortex-A53 design. It uses the Cortex-A57 design. In fact, they're an octa-core chip with four of each of those inside that CPU. But previously, before the shift was made to 64-bit, Qualcomm was using its architectural license to design its own cores, and it became very popular using its crate cores that we were found in the Snapdragon 801, the Snapdragon 805, and others. Now, the Snapdragon 820 that's coming out has also got uh, Qualcomm's own designed core, and this time it's called Cryo. So it used its architectural license to build its own design and put it into its own system on a chip. However, it's still using ARM's cores in other of its system on a chip. For example, the Snapdragon 652 will use four Cortex-A53 cores and four Cortex-A72 cores. So across its whole product range, Qualcomm has a whole different set of cores. Some are from ARM and some are from its own design team. So if Qualcomm were a classic example of an ARM licensee, then Apple is an atypical example. You see, Qualcomm makes its system on a chip and it sells them to other smartphone makers like Sony or HTC or even to Samsung. Whereas Apple only makes chips for its own phones. It doesn't sell them to anybody else. 
Now, up until the iPhone 4S, uh, Apple were using ARM's Cortex designs. In fact, the iPhone 4S had a dual-core Cortex A9 chip inside of it. But with the release of the iPhone 5, what happened is, is that Apple had bought a silicon design company a few years before called uh, PA Semi, and they used that team to design their own uh, ARM core using their architectural license that they had from ARM. And the result was the custom core, which we call Swift, and that's what was found in the iPhone 5. Then when the release of the iPhone 5S came out, Apple actually really had a lead on everybody else in the fact that it released a 64-bit core called Cyclone. And this actually left other people like Qualcomm and Samsung kind of uh, in, in the dirt, really, because they were now, from how history played out, there was 18 months before Qualcomm and Samsung were able to bring out 64-bit chips. So Apple took the lead by designing their own custom core 64-bit chip. Of course, that 64-bit chip has to be compatible with ARM's architecture. And so what about Samsung? Well, Samsung is a classic uh, ARM licensee. It has a core license and it also has an architectural license. For example, the Exynos 7420 that you might find in the Samsung Galaxy S6 uses four Cortex-A53 cores and four Cortex-A57 cores. And those core designs have come directly from ARM. However, the new series of chips that it's designed, the Exynos 8 series, is going to use four Cortex-A53 cores directly from ARM, but it's also going to use four of its own cores, which it's designed in-house, and that is currently codenamed Mongoose. And we don't know the performance of that, we don't know how it's going to turn out, but that's what our Samsung are planning, we think, for the Galaxy S7, and then for the next Note that comes after that, and so on. Now, another company that has an architectural license is NVIDIA. Now, NVIDIA have core licenses and an architectural license. If you remember, when the original Nexus 7 tablet was released, it used a chip called the NVIDIA Tegra 3. Now, after the success of the NVIDIA Tegra 3, uh, NVIDIA then tried to make the uh, Tegra 4 and the 4i. And due to various problems in the development process, maybe some managerial problems, those chips turned out to be pretty poor and behind the rest of the competition, and they didn't really have much commercial success. But moving on from the Tegra 4, the company then went on to release the Tegra K1. Now, the K1 was a bit of a funny chip because it came in two different formats. It could either be a 32-bit Cortex A15 design, quad core, or it could be a dual core 64-bit design using a core known as Denver or Project Denver. Now, Project Denver was using ARM's architectural license to build a chip that could is compatible with ARM's architectural, but was actually designed in-house by NVIDIA. Now, the difference with the Denver core was that it's actually trying to use a technology called code morphing, which means that the actual chip itself could theoretically run any computer instruction set from any design, and when it, it's presented with those instructions, it breaks them down internally, morphs them into its own instruction set, which it then runs on the silicon. If you remember, there was a company called Transmeta that briefly employed Linus Torvilds, the creator of the Linux or Linux operating system, and that company tried to do exactly the same thing. Now, the story from the industry insiders is that the uh, NVIDIA chip, the NVIDIA Denver project, was actually going to be able to run both Intel and ARM uh, instruction sets at the same time. However, what happened is they couldn't get a license from Intel and it just got left using the ARM instruction set. Now, that chip did see the light of day and in fact, it is the chip that is inside the Nexus 9 tablet. Now, if you want to find out more information about the background behind code morphing, the background behind how NVIDIA is designing their uh, CPUs, then please check out semiaccurate.com. It's a good source for this kind of information. Now, the problem is, is that the Denver project really was kind of a bit bold on NVIDIA's part because Transmeta had tried this approach before and basically failed to cut the company closed down. And NVIDIA claimed they had big plans for this technology. However, we don't really think the project's alive anymore. There's nothing really else going on. NVIDIA aren't talking about it anymore. And in fact, the X1, the next chip that came out, the Tegra X1, went back to using ARM's core designs, ARM Cortex-A53 and ARM Cortex-A57. Now, we've seen there are lots of different ways to source an ARM-compatible core. The question is, are custom cores actually better? And of course, this leads to the question, what do you mean by better? Of course, there are different characteristics we can use. There's performance, that's certainly a characteristic we can measure, but then there's also efficiency. 
and there's also the cost associated with the design and manufacture of their chip of that chip then there is marketing what impact does having a custom core have on marketing and then there's diversity do they design just one core or do they design many cores when it comes to performance we might be able to say that apple have the lead and this actually makes sense because Apple have been making their own custom 64-bit cores now for three generations. First you had Cyclone, and then you had Typhoon, and then you had Twister. In fact, even ARM itself is only on its second generation of 64-bit cores. You had the Cortex-A57, then you had the Cortex-A72. That's the second generation, and yet we haven't heard about, there haven't been any official announcement anyway about the third generation. And Qualcomm and Samsung are only now producing their first generation 64-bit ARM compatible cores. So in that sense, we can expect Apple to be ahead in terms of performance. But what about efficiency? Who has the most efficient core out there? Well, actually, that prize does go to ARM itself because not only does ARM produce the A72 and the A57 cores, it also produces the A53 cores, and it's also recently announced the A35 cores. And this also brings us to the issue of diversity. Apple are only designing one core for one specific task. Qualcomm are designing only one core for one specific task. Samsung are only designing one core for one specific task. Whereas ARM have the Cortex A35, the Cortex A53, the Cortex A57, and the Cortex A72, and there are other cores coming down the pipeline that we expect to be announced during 2016. And of course, that brings us to marketing. What is the point of all this in terms of marketing? Well, there seems to be some power in saying we have our own core that we've designed, and then they can, they can trot out all lots of statistics about what it means, and maybe that has an influence over consumers about which phone they're going to buy because they like the idea that it has a particular custom core designed by their favorite company. So what does all this mean? Well, first of all, it means there's plenty of choice for consumers, and choice is good. If you want a, a Cortex A72 core, you can have it. If you want Mongoose, that's available. If you want Cryo, you could try that. If you want one of Apple's cores, go with that. The choice is really yours as the consumer. Secondly, it means there's plenty of competition amongst these different design teams. Each team is able to be pushed by another team to achieve new goals, to achieve new ends, to push the technology to the next level. If there was no competition, then this technology could stagnate. My name is Gary Sims from Android Authority, and I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. Also, please don't forget to subscribe to Android Authority's YouTube channel. Don't forget to check out our website, androidauthority.com. And also don't forget to use the comments below to tell me what you think about the different core designs that are available from the different companies. And as for me, I'll see you in my next video.